Thank you. Welcome. Just glad that you're here this morning. To those of you who are joining us online, we just want to welcome you as well. I'm glad that you're here. And um, uh, to the rest of you, you've seen the handouts. Uh, This is not an ultra bright commercial going on here. Uh, The church really wants to know how your love life is. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, Should be fun. Um, I shared with a few of my uh, my young folk uh, to give our d- district superintendent a hard time about that. Um, did they did they give you a hard time? They didn't. They're a little bit okay. They didn't let me down. I knew I could count on them. I can always count on them. Well, I, I I'm glad that you're here, and uh, I'm I'm glad that we have gotten together. I know you didn't get come here to see me. Uh, that's not why we've gathered. That's not why you've gotten online. You did, and I'm pretty sure you didn't do that to see uh, our district superintendent, Reverend Purcell. Um, you gathered here to be with Jesus. Isn't that right? Let me ask you a question. Are you persuaded that he is able? Amen. Amen. That's why we're here. Let me open with a word of prayer for you, and we want to then welcome uh, our DS as well. Father in heaven, I just come to you in the name of God the Father, in the name of God the Son, and in the name of God the Holy Spirit. And as we've gathered here, Lord, we have come uh, bringing you with us, and yet you have said, Lord Jesus Christ, That where two or more would gather, you would be in the mix. And that's where your spirit would be. And so, Lord, even though you're with us all the time, there's something very unique that takes place when we gather together like this that only happens in this circumstance. And Holy Spirit, do what you want to do in this service. Have your way with us. We're here. To worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. To give you honor in song. To give you honor in prayer. To give you uh, worship, Lord, in as we listen to your word. And the truth of us being changed will never be the same for having been here. And we believe that. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory. The King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would let down your life. That I would be set free. Who brings our chaos 
back into order who brings us darkness a son and daughter the king of glory the king above all kings who rolls the oceans with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you would lay down the line that i would be set free Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered. Good the grave, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Hey, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. You would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life, that I would be set free. Jesus is seen for all that you done for me. Amen. ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one that could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh, we live for you. We live for you, oh we live for you. 
gives up and never fails us. concerns, um, as you know, uh, at this point. But, um, you know, last week, Charlie lost his oldest brother, um, and we were praying for him. And this week, he found out that the next brother down has just uh, has been diagnosed with cancer and has a brain tumor. And so I just felt like I should make us all aware of that and, and uh, to be in prayer for Charlie and for his family. Father in heaven, we come to you, the great I am, and we come to you, Lord, with our heart cup lifted right side up. And we're not asking you to fill it, Lord. We, we're acknowledging that you're already filling it. And Lord, we want more of you. And that's what we long for, and that's what we hope for when we gather into these gatherings like this. More of you. Make us more like you as you send us out into your world, Lord. Help us to be like you. Fill us with your spirit in ways we, 
we understand that, that are beyond us and bigger than us and make us aware. And as we come to you, O oh God, as the church, we, we pray for one another in the church. And I just want to live to you those, uh, Lord, who've had surgeries this, uh, this week. And I pray that you would just be the God uh, who is uh, the, the God of healing in their life. And together, Lord, and I, I watched the faces as I made the announcement, we, we come to you and we lift Charlie and his family to you and we just ask that you would, that you would, you would just enter in. That you would do what only you can do. And we pray this morning, Lord, for Tim and his brother and, and, and Lord, as he's going through the same thing. be with him we pray father that you would just help those both online and in this room who are part of us who struggle in relationships right now and you are the God of reconciliation and you will help us and we pray father for those who struggle financially in this economy and you know who they are And I praise you for them, Lord, because I, as I speak with them, they keep leaning in on you. And you've never failed us. What an awesome God you are. Lord, cause us to grow, and we pray for our church leadership, Lord, and we, we just ask that you would be with those who are on the mission field, and we want to lift them to you, too. We turn in this moment our hearts and our eyes from us. Lord, that would be horrible that we would not care about those that you sent us to. So we pray for our neighbors. Pray for each neighborhood that's represented here. And cause those conversations to take place, Lord. Those Holy Spirit intersections this coming week. We thank you for meeting with us and helping us in the conversations of the week past. But give us souls for our hire. Father, we pray for leadership in our city. We pray for the leadership of our state. We pray for the leadership of our nation, the leadership, Lord, of this world. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the incarnation. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the empty tomb and the promise. And for the ascension and being our high priest even in this hour. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your spirit to the church. Jesus, we love you. And all the people of God said, amen and amen and amen. Let's worship the Lord with his tithes and our offerings. <coughs> Father in heaven, we just ask that you would bless both the gift and the giver in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. fashion the way we do offering but it is a good thing and it is worship and I you know I, I don't know if you saw it but Milo was like done all this happy dance when he was given and um, 
Jesus said, a child shall lead us. And, and, and Terry, I was thinking next week is your turn to do the happy dance, okay? It, we are happy, that's for sure. God loves a cheerful giver. Well, uh, we're in for a treat. Um, he, is, he doesn't work for the toothpaste company. I promise you that. He works for the Lord. Uh, Tim, may God bless you. The platform is yours. And, and the Lord's, of course. How, how close do I have to stay here for the camera? Oh, do I need to? Have, well, we have the camera. That camera's geared up here. I can rearrange that one. So well, I'll, stay, I'll stand up here. Okay. Okay. Hey, good morning. good morning. Don't be scared by the provocative sermon title, okay? We are... Let me get you a different stand. No, this is fine. Oh, okay. We are not going to the Song of Solomon to talk about how's your love life. We're going to go to 1 John chapter 4. Uh, before I do that, let me update you a little bit. Okay, there we go. There you go. We forgot you were tall. Yeah. Just uh, think how tall I'd be if coffee hadn't stunted my growth. Mercy. How come you all sit so far back when we have these wonderful seats up here? You know, we don't, we don't charge you extra for these seats, I'm, I'm telling you. Let me update you a little bit, uh, just uh, from some news from other churches and around the district. Uh, the big news is that we are no longer the Iowa-Minnesota district. As of last summer, we merged with the Northwest District of the Wesleyan Church, and now our district is actually the northern half of the United States from the Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean, plus throw in the state of Alaska. Um, so it's an enormous area. We are now over 100 churches instead of 30 churches that we were. And uh, I am no longer the district superintendent. Uh, I'm an assistant superintendent, but my responsibilities are basically the same as uh, I have a responsibility for the states of Iowa and Minnesota. But I did get to offload most of my administrative uh, responsibilities and that caused revival to break out in my soul. Um, and now I get to work a little more with pastors and churches than I did. And uh, guess what else? I just found out like three weeks ago, I have been assigned to uh, do the Alaska church visits. So that's, uh, that's going to be okay. Uh, that's going to be okay. Um, so that's the big news, and um, God's, God's just really, really working. Within the last several months, we've started uh, two new churches, one in Sibley, Iowa. Dawn and I were there just uh, a few weeks ago. That's exciting. And, and a new church in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, called Revolution Community Church. And that church is particularly exciting because it's, it's based on recovery ministry. And some of the stories there of redemption and freedom are just absolutely incredible. Uh, got to eat supper with a lady who had to keep an eye on the clock because uh, she had to be back to jail in time. Um, but God was redeeming her. Isn't that great? And uh, so, so thank God for that. <clears throat> and then another really exciting thing. Have any of you heard of a ministry called Immigrant Connections? Nope, you're about to. Immigrant Connections was actually a ministry started in a Wesleyan church in Indiana, and it's kind of spread all over the United States. And Immigrant Connections, well, how many of you know our immigration system's really broken? Has anybody picked up on that? And I, and I don't care where you're at on the political spectrum, you have to admit it's broken. And... Um, so Immigrant Connection was begun to assist immigrants in navigating that whole process, that complicated process, trying to seek citizenship. And we started an Immigrant Connection in Mankato, and God has just opened doors incredibly. Um, and so far, just since last May, we've already helped 20 immigrants achieve full citizenship in the United States, which I think is a really cool thing. 
And uh, so God's working in lots of different ways, and uh, I'm excited to be here today as well. All right, let's, uh, let's get to this love life thing. Um, so if you can answer the question, my love life's great, I guess you can leave. Um, but uh, I don't want anybody to leave. Yeah, Debbie just got up and started to leave, I think, yeah. You just put a smile on his face, Debbie. Um, so question, agree or disagree, every human being, without exception, is born with a need to love and, and be loved. Yes or no? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. Um, and you, you see it everywhere. You ever notice how many movies made have some kind of love story as its theme? You know, whether it's a broken relationship between a father and son or a man or a woman or whatever. Um, probably most movies. In fact, Hallmark Channel makes a living. Any Hallmark Channel watchers here? Are you? Okay. Nothing to be ashamed of. Just want to tell you that. <laughs> so, you ever, yeah, I, we love those, even if some of the stories are kind of cheesy. Because everybody loves a love story, right? With a happy ending. You know, and and it, it's it's funny. It seems like every Hallmark movie kind of follows the same pattern. You know, big city business tycoon goes back home to his small town where he grew up for Christmas and reconnects with his high school sweetheart and um, realizes how empty his life is without love. And he quits his big job in the city and marries his high school sweetheart, and they start a nonprofit to rescue abandoned puppies. So there you go. You know, something like that. <laughs> and Because we love a love story. Ever, ever consider how many songs have love as its theme? You know, it doesn't matter what genre of music you like, whether it's country or pop or classical or oldies or whatever. Most of those songs are about love. I read about a guy who was visiting a Navajo Indian reservation, and he asked this Navajo Indian, I've noticed something. How, how come so many of your songs are about rain? And the Navajo said, it's because we have so little water. And then the Navajo asked him, how come so many of your songs are about love? Good point. Maybe because in our world, there's so little of it. And we long for it. We human beings want so much to love and be loved. But can we admit we're just so bad at it? I mean, as human beings. I, I, I think most people don't understand what it really is. I think most people don't understand how costly it is. And I'm not just talking about the general population. I'm talking about us. I'm talking about Christ followers. And I think the past few years have really highlighted that fact. I mean, there's always going to be the ongoing issue of loving difficult people, right? Does anybody here have a difficult person in their life? Is anybody here the difficult person in somebody else's life? <laughs> you know, there's always those challenges, but man, the last few years have been crazy. Um, and, and I've watched... Christian people who, who really love God and want to serve him. I've watched Christian people fight over masks or no masks and leave churches over masks or no masks or vaccination or no vaccination. I've watched political polarization. I've watched people leave a church because the pastor would not publicly endorse their political candidate of choice. I have seen that. It, 
In the words of Albert Tate, many Christians have forgotten that we don't follow an elephant or a donkey, we follow a lamb. Isn't that a great statement? And all the while, this world who is saying, somebody just show me how to love, they're watching us do that. So today we're going to do a deep dive into this thing called love and try to get a handle on how God calls us to love. We're going to go into 1 John chapter 4. We're going to start in verses 9 through 11. I wish I had time to start at verse 7. But we'll kind of pick up some of that as we go along. After establishing in verses 7 and 8 that love comes from God and indeed God is love. That it is not something God does or something he has. John says it is what he is. He can't not love. After establishing that, there are some characteristics of love that jump out in verses 9 through 12. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So, so just real quickly, I, I see three characteristics of God's love. Okay, remember, God is what? God is love. We love because why? He first loved us. All right. So if we want to know what love is, and the Greek word used here is agape, which is that highest, most extreme form of love. If we want to know what love is, he is our example. Agreed? Okay. So here are some characteristics I see from those verses. First of all, God's love initiates. He loved first. He loved first. He sent his one and only son into the world. He sent. He initiated. Remember when the angel appeared to Joseph in Matthew 1, 23? And, and to, tell, to tell Joseph, it's okay. You can take Mary as your wife because believe it or not, that baby in her really has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. And the angel said this to Joseph. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Not God out there. God right here. God with us. That's God initiating, not staying at a distance. That's God looking at humanity and saying, somehow, some way, I've got to build a bridge. Somehow, some way, I've got to reach these people that I love. It's stunning. And then again, verse 10. We just read it, but let's look at it again from 1 John 4. This is love. Not that we love God, but he loved us. And sent his son as an atoning sacrifice. And then later in verse 19... We love because why? He first loved us. So that's one mark of God's love. It initiates. He did not wait for us to come to him. What does the scripture say? While we were yet, what? Sinners, what happened? 
Christ died for us. When we could care less, he died for us. So that's love initiating, okay? Agape love goes first. Agape love doesn't hold back and say, I'm going to wait for you to get your act together. All right, here's the second one. God's love restores, it gives life. Look at verse 9. This is how God showed his love among us. How? How did he show his love among us? He sent his one and only son into the world that we might what? What's the point of him sending his son into the world that we might what? This is not a trick question. Live. True or false? When you really love someone, you want them to live. You want them to experience the best life has to offer, right? I mean, you want the best for somebody you love. You don't want to hold them down. You want the best. That's why, and we've all experienced this, that's why when somebody we love is making bad decisions that we know is going to rob them of life, we pray for them and we reach out and, oh, no, don't go there. You're not going to like how this turns out. Why? Because I want the best for you. So here's the thing. God's desire for humanity. God's desire for you and God's desire for me is to restore. Restore what? Restore life. To restore everything that Satan has stolen from us, going clear back to our first parents in the Garden of Eden. Jesus came into the world, Emmanuel, God with us, to restore what was stolen. Not only eternal life, but abundant life. Not coincidentally, it was the same John who penned in his gospel, I have come that they might have life and have it, can you fill in the blank, more abundantly, or NIV says have it to the full. That's why I came. So that's another characteristic of God's love. It restores. But here's the third one. It sacrifices. It does whatever it takes. Uh, verse 10 again. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning, what? Sacrifice. Love sacrifices, it gives, it pays the price, it does what it takes. So think about some of the sacrifices that Jesus made in becoming Emmanuel, God with us, in coming to planet Earth. Well, let's start with an easy one. He, uh, he came from heaven to Earth. How many of you know that's a rotten trade? From paradise to a planet where on the last day of April, it still drops below freezing at night and the wind blows and it rains. He gave up kingship for servanthood, from commanding angels to leading a band of no-name disciples. He gave up omnipotence. He gave up omnipresence to be enslaved by a human body where he needed to eat and sleep. The sinless one chose to live among the sinful ones to lead them to God. God's love went the distance. So, so okay, so there it is. God's love initiates. He goes first. He doesn't hold back. He restores. Wants to give you life. Wants to, by the way, that's one of the things that's so wrong with the way most people seek love. Most people seek love for what I can get out of it and not for what I can give to it. 
which is why so many marriages can't make it. That's, a, that's another sermon for another time. We don't have that example from God. God does not love us for what he can get from us. He loves us because he wants to give to us. And, and, and it also sacrifices, goes the distance. There's no price that love is not willing to pay. So that's pretty awesome, right? Who wouldn't want to serve a God like that? But now let's get to the hard part. After establishing the characteristics of love, we're going to turn the corner and we're going to talk about love's command. Now it gets a little hard. It gets a little difficult. Starting at verse 19, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is, did John really say this? He's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen, cannot. He not only says does not, he says he cannot love God whom he's not seen. And he's given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And then let's back up to John's gospel real quick. Chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. The distinctive mark of discipleship is not how faithfully you attend church, although we hope you do. It is not how many Bible studies you've gone to, although that's fantastic. It is not how many Bible verses you have committed to memory, although I encourage you to do so. Jesus says the distinctive mark of a disciple the way that people will know that you're a Christ follower is whether or not we love well. Period. And so here's the hard part. If you consider yourself a Christ follower, love is a command, not a choice. John lays it on the line and says, don't, don't say you love God if you hate your brother. You cannot love God and hate a person whom God indwells. It's that simple. And this same theme shows up over and over and over in Scripture. Um, if you love God... You'll love others because that's part and parcel of loving God. If you love God, you'll love others because the love of God fills you and you can't not love. You can't separate the two. And, and you don't love others as a means of earning God's love. You love because you've embraced God's love. In fact, that's the only way you can consistently love others. So loving our brothers and sisters is hard enough. Um, but check this out, Matthew 5. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your neighbors and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be sons of your father in heaven. What does that mean? That you may be sons, that you may be daughters. So that you can have that family resemblance. That people can look at you and know that you're a child of God. Enemies. Wow. That jerk boss. That person who accused you of doing something you didn't do. That person who you fill in the blank.
Can I confess something to you? We're all friends here, right? This isn't going online or anything, is it? Oh, no. I'll, I'll go ahead and confess. I don't mind the command to love others if I get to define what love is. The problem is, Jesus says, love one another as what? As I have loved you. That's the hard part. Now, if I get to define love, no problem. Yes, I lost my anger and screamed at you, but I did it in love. No. As I have loved you. So the hard part is loving others the same way God loves us. Now, we established that, didn't we? How did he love us? Remember your three points? Were you listening? There will be a test. It initiates. It restores. And it sacrifices. And to never stop loving because Jesus loves us. I, I, I want to wrap this up and... and I, I may wrap this up by going somewhere a little dangerous here. So that's okay. I, I want to talk about some practical steps I think can help improve our love life. Because let's be honest. It's not as simple as snapping your fingers and saying, I'm just going to be a more loving person. Because how many of you know that we live in a world, we live in a culture, we live in a society that makes it hard to love? Have you figured that out? Makes it hard. So here are some things that seem to make a difference for me. Now, whether they fit you or not, that's up to you. But let me just suggest these things, and, and we could, there'd be way more than this. But for me, these things seem to help. The first one is to embrace God's love in humility and gratitude. Titus 3, 3 to 5 says this, At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of what? His mercy. If you are a child of God, it was not because you brought anything to the table. Right? You okay with that? It's because of his mercy. Now, here's the thing I've discovered. The longer we are Christians, the harder it is to remember that. The longer that we know Jesus, the more difficult it is to live in gratitude for salvation. Have you noticed that? But when I live in light of the fact that God loves me in spite of what I am, not because of it, when I live in light of the fact that I am saved totally and completely by grace and I bring nothing to the equation. It creates this sense of, after the way God has loved me, how dare I withhold love from anyone? Okay? So that's one. How do you do that? Oh, scripture, being still before the Lord. On the way up here, I just listened to worship songs. Thank God for my salvation. Thank God for his mercy. Here's another one that has 
becoming increasingly important to me is to develop filters. Um, look at what Paul says in Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is praiseworthy, excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So that's, there's an important principle here. Action follows emotions, which follows thought. So in other words, right thinking leads to right feeling, leads to right action. So, so Paul says, fill your mind with the good, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Conversely, along with filling our minds with the excellent, the praiseworthy, et cetera, et cetera, to me it's logical that I have to filter out the stuff that is not those things. So to be a consistently loving person, I need to feed my mind the true, the noble, et cetera, et cetera. And along with filling my mind through those things, through reading, through listening, through worship, through healthy relationships, I have to filter out certain things as well. To be blunt... To be blunt, um, I have to be very cautious about what I take into my thought life uh, through entertainment. There was a movie my wife and I were going to go to last night. The storyline, I won't tell you what movie it is. The storyline looked like it was cute, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It was going to be in our theater down there. And she got online and just read a review. And we decided, no, we don't, we don't need to put that in our minds. So we didn't go. To be blunt, I have become very cautious about where I get my news. This is the part where I might get in trouble with some folks. Because regardless of whether the news comes from the right or the left, it also comes with a healthy dose of accusation and anger. And I'm not talking about political positions here. That's what I'm talking about. I think the Bible ought to inform our political positions. But I just find, and, and I've, I've quit listening to political talk radio, because again, it just comes with angst and anger. And I find myself absorbing that if I'm not careful. You okay? And if I'm not careful, I absorb the unchrist like rhetoric and attitude. So. filters, whatever that means for you, okay? But I have to filter out anything that makes it harder for me to love anybody. Let me say it again. I have to filter out anything that makes it harder for me to love anybody. And I'm not, I'm not talking about granting approval to sin. I'm talking about love. One more. And this is a hard one. But I think it's important to let go of your rights and become a servant. Philippians 2, 5 through 7 Paul writes, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. Okay. 
The cool thing about serving is while I'm serving, I'm not thinking about myself. You remember that scene where Jesus washed the disciples' feet in the upper room just a few hours before his crucifixion? Did it ever occur to you that he washed Judas' feet even though he knew that Judas had betrayed him? (laughs) How hard would that be? But he did it. Why? Because he was a servant. He did it because he loved, not for what he could get back, because let's face it, he got nothing back from Judas but betrayal. He loved because he is love. Oh, and by the way, don't get the idea that serving is for weak people. Here's a good definition of serving. Serving is leveraging my power and influence for the benefit of others. That's all serving is. How can I make your life better? So let's wrap this up. In a world that is longing to love and be loved, as the old song goes, in a world that's looking for love in all the wrong places, If we Christ followers can love well, we will have so many open doors to the gospel. How many of you know that you will never win anybody to Jesus by winning an argument? Not ever. But you can and will. By loving well. If we can learn to love well, I promise you, we will have the attention of our culture. But it's costly. And it takes courage. And may God give us that courage to love well. May I pray with you, please? Heavenly Father, we're just so very, very thankful that you loved first. You always love first. We don't stand before you as redeemed people because we initiated. We stand before you as redeemed people because you initiated and we simply responded. Teach us how to just soak in your love so that love becomes a part of our character. That because of our relationship with you, we can't not love. Now, doesn't mean love doesn't confront. Doesn't mean that love doesn't say hard things sometimes. But it always loves. It initiates. It restores sacrifices. So in this world that's so badly so badly wants to know how to love, where to find love. I pray that they would see it in us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. Anything you want to say? Okay. Go ahead. Thank you, brother. Thank you, thank you. 
very timely. May God, his very self, cause his face and his countenance to shine upon you. May he give you the intersections that we prayed about this morning, this week. May you find yourself, when you rise each morning, grateful that he's given you another day with which to live for him. And when you put your head on the pillow each night of this week, may you be able to say, God, it has been good to have been with you throughout this day. Go in God's peace. God bless you.